Hello, everybody. <laughs> those of us, uh, those of you joining us uh, on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, I'm Eve Rickard. I am uh, the publisher for Thorn Apple Press and the author of the forthcoming book, Non Monogamy and Jealousy. I'm joining from uh, unceded ancestral Lekwungen and Wusainit territories uh, on Rhode Island uh, in BC. And with me is Carrie Jenkins. Hi everyone, I'm Carrie Jenkins. Um, I'm joining from the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh, colonially known as Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Carrie is uh, the author of these two excellent books that I own, What Love Is and What It Could Be, and Sad Love, Romance, and The Search for Meaning, which I'm completely obsessed with. Um, and also the author of our forthcoming book, Non-Monogamy and Happiness, uh, which is the third book in the More Than Two Essentials series, uh, which is books on non-monogamy by Canadian authors that I am curating. So uh, today we're going to talk a bit about um, Carrie's work, including her, uh, her newest book. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the series, and then I'm going to talk about my book in the series, which is Non-Monogamy and Jealousy, scheduled to come out early next year. Which I'm really excited so, about. Um, so Carrie and I uh, met, uh, I want to say, I guess it was six, almost seven years ago now. It was I early 2000. Yeah, it was just after the pub publication of What Love Is, um, because I remember it was at Converge Con in Vancouver, and you gave the keynote speech, and I was amazed, and I ran across the street to Book Warehouse to get a copy of your books so that I could run back across the street and get you to sign it. <laughs> and, That's right. And I, I don't remember you rocking up and asking me to sign it. I was like, oh my goodness, you're Eve Rickert? Oh, and then... <laughs> Yeah, and I think just somehow fangirl moment. Yeah, somehow you got or had a copy of more than two, which I signed, and then I we have this picture somewhere of the two of us standing together holding each other's books. So, um, yeah, that was a great moment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I've been a follower of your work for a long time. Um, I really love uh, the way that you. Um, in particular with uh, sad love, like I just want to say for anyone who I, identifies with the idea of relationship anarchy, like this is the book for you. <laughs> this is a like the book about relationship anarchy, although I can't remember if you ever say that in the book. Um, but it's <laughs> all about, um, you know, crafting bespoke relationships and throwing away the idea of, um, <clears throat> you know, why don't you talk about it and then talk about how it ties yeah, yeah. into this new book that you wrote? <laughs> I I would love to. I mean, because, you know, obviously the, the clue is in the titles, right? Sad love and then uh, non-monogamy and happiness. I, I um, it was it, it felt like the perfect uh, the perfect follow on in, in the sequence. But yeah, so it's sad love. Um, I, I, you know, relationship anarchy is one of those phrases that I never know how to define myself but um i i don't use the phrase in this book but i i talk about um crafting love and crafting relationships in ways that break us away from the standard narrative so the one size fits all fairy tale boy meets girl boy marries girl boy marries uh, boy and girl set up some some mortgage some laundry some some babies arrive and you know da, 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 and then eventually they both die that that story um I, I i'm really interested in um every every love story apart from that one um and especially in in sad love i i'm interested in um critiquing the idea that that is the way to be happy uh, and that's the happy ever after version of of love and of life um and actually i'm not just critiquing that the idea that that's the way to be happy i'm critiquing the idea that the pursuit of happiness is even a, a sound goal <laughs> for for uh, planning mm -hmm. life around um and you know in in place of happiness i i try to to center ideas of, of meaningfulness and of uh, what i call eudaimonia um which are you know other ways of understanding what it is to to live a good life and to have a good love um and so that that kind of love, I I want to say, has room for all 
kinds of emotions, the, the so-called positive ones like happiness, joy, and the so-called negative ones like sadness and anger. Um, it's not defined by any emotion. It has space for all of them. They're all valuable. They're all important. Um, they're all things we need to listen to. So, so enter this little book, um, which is where I take, um, I take the story on a few more steps and think about, well, what is specifically what are the relationships between our ideas of, of, of happiness and happy ever after love narratives and non-monogamous love because of course the happy the happy ever after fairy tale is a very very monogamous love story um and all of the um all of the stories about non-monogamous love that i had heard until i was you know into my 30s i think both fictional and real life were were definitely not ones with a happy ending and i i think that's important interesting and you know something we have to talk about so can you uh can you talk a little bit about about what people will find in if they pick up this book yes um so uh let's see what what am i up to in the book what i how would i how would i give the elevator pitch for this um i i sort of want I want to take that starting point of asking why don't we hear non-monogamous stories with happy endings um, and from there i want to kind of go below the surface so so a quick fix is let's tell non-monogamous love stories with happy endings that's not the solution i think i mean it's part of the solution of course we should be telling all kinds of stories not just one kind of love story um, but it's not the be all and end all of a solution um, because uh, if we don't also unpick how ideals of happiness are being used to control us, to control our choices, especially our romantic choices. And if we don't understand ultimately how those that kind of control is politically motivated and how it fits into a much bigger context of global capitalism, patriarchy, colonialism, racism, if we don't understand that this is actually a very, very political question and the question of what will make us happy is a very, very, um, is one that sits within that much bigger political picture, uh, then we're going to, we're going to miss the point, uh, you know, and not just the large scale point, but also potentially, you know, the, the point of, uh, as it, as it impacts our own lives, um, because these strands, I, I've, in, in Sad Love, I talk about, I, I talk about these things as daimones, which is just an, old Greek word for a supernatural being or spirit. So like a eudaimonic means it's a it's a philosopher's term of art, but it literally means good good spirited. Uh, and the you is good, like you euphemism is a good word. Um, euphoria is a good feeling. Uh, eudaimonia is a good spirit. Um, so these these things that I call that I call the the eudaimonic um, spirits, they can be absolutely anything from the little voice in your head telling you you're not good enough for a relationship or it's sinful to, to love in this kind of way and not that kind of way. Um, right up to, you know, the uh, global patriarchy, right? <laughs> Which is telling you something about how gender roles should manifest in a relationship. Unless we're aware of that and how all of these things are uh, operating uh, amongst one another and interacting with one another to make our love lives go well or badly, um, unless we understand all of that, um, we're not as empowered as, as we might be to make good choices and, and even more so, I think, to, to evaluate ourselves within these dynamics. Very easy tendency to blame ourselves or to blame individuals for relationship problems that are really not our fault <laughs> um, and that actually, uh, that actually come from the operation of much bigger entities, for forces well beyond our control, um, that are that are shaping and and determining our lives in these really, you know, uh, ultimately concrete and material ways, but that feel quite abstract until we see the connection. Can you give an example of that? Yeah, that's really yeah. interesting to me. Yeah, no, this is this is this big picture stuff is all abstract until we start to put the 
the, the concrete examples on the table. Um, but, you know, just to sort of, so, so, so one of the, you know, who, you know who else was giving a, a keynote at that Converge Con was Kim Tolbert. Um, she and I were the two keynotes. That's people. right. That's and, right. Yeah. And that, so that was my first introduction to her work. Um, and I was kind of blown away by this. So, so uh, mm -hmm. Tolbert is um, yeah, same. doing some really interesting decolonial work around love and relationships. Um, you know, and I sort of want to say before it was cool, but before it was as, uh, you know, as well known or as big of a deal as it as it might be now, mm -hmm. um, she was already in there at this conversation. Um, so so one of the things I do in um, in this little book, particularly, is I draw on some of Tolbert's um, ideas, some of her thinking around how uh, colonial structures or colonial ideas about what a family should be. Have uh, have been imposed on these uh, these lands that we're currently um, settlers within. You and I uh, are currently here, you know, um, in in these places where uh, European ideas or ideals of um, family life of of good relationshiping have been imported and um, made manifest in a place to which they are, you know, ultimately. Uh, not in indigenous. Um, and so how does that play out in, you know, in real terms? Well, she talks about things like uh, the division of, uh, the colonial division of land into parcels that mimic the structure of a nuclear family uh, and the placing of a man at the head of that family unit um, with, you know, one woman and any number of biological children that are supposed to go with that family unit. So the kind of impos the physical imposition onto the land of a certain structure manifesting uh, European colonial ideals about what a family should look like. Um, so, um, you know, these things are very, they can actually be very physical, very tangible, but until we see how they connect up to um, abstract, um, abstract ideas like that the natural or normative way of having relationships should look like that, should look like a monogamous nuclear family. Um, it might not be obvious, but now I look out my window here, downtown Vancouver, and I see all of these little apartments that are of course the same, the same shape with the same design and the same intention in mind and very little connection to let's say extended family, to communities, to other kinds of uh, caring, loving, supporting relationships beyond or outside the nuclear family, beyond the monogamous expectation. Uh, and those things are not just, um, those kinds of relationships, uh, they're not just uh, abstractly devalued by what Elizabeth Brake calls amato normativity, the prioritization of the romantic dyad, um, but they're, they're, they are physically deprioritized by our very you know, way of, of, of um, our, our very way of organizing and arranging our, our physical space as well. So, so um, you know, that's just one example, one kind of example, um, but it's one that I'm, um, yeah, I, I'm talking about in, in this book in particular. And yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to trace that connection back to, um, to that event where we first met. I hadn't thought about it until just now. Yeah, it's true. That was also my introduction to, to Kim Talbert as well. And I'm also a huge fan of her work. And I think that she is the person who kind of really got those conversations going in a, in a way that was visible to the, to more mainstream folks for sure. I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Credit to credit. You said something. Yeah. Um, I would, I would love to publish a book by her someday. <laughs> who knows? It could, it could happen. Cool, um, I know. Seriously, if you're watching, um, you said something um, a little while back that I want to come back to, which is uh, something about stories that are used to control us. Uh, and I wanted to come back to that as well and see if you could say more about that, because I think that's really interesting. And I, it is something that is talked about in your, your first, uh, these two books as well. Um, in particular, I think in what love is, and so I, I would love to hear you say more about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so what love is? So, so yeah. Going back to ye old, ye olden days, my my first book on love. Um, I I'm laying out uh, a big picture where I say uh, romantic love is is this. Um, uh, I call it dual natured phenomenon. So there's a biological aspect to it, right? We're 
the kinds of animals that we are. We have the kinds of evolutionary past that we have. We have, you know, the uh, the brain chemistry that we do and all of the things that go on in our brains and bodies when we are experiencing love. Um, and also we are social animals and we make social constructs. And so the other part of, of romantic love's dual nature is its socially constructed aspect. So a lot of the questions I'm interested in are about where those things match up or don't match up the, the biology of love and the social, the socially constructed scripts that it's supposed to fit into. Um, but those scripts um, are, you know, the stories that are that are designed to control us. Um, the simplest one is, you know, we, we learn it very early on in the playground rhyme, right? So and so and so and so sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G, first comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in a baby carriage, right? So that's that's a that's a life plan for uh, <laughs> mapped out for us before mm -hmm. we're old enough to have our BS detectors online to be able to evaluate whether that's one we want for ourselves or not. Um, it's also being told to us all the time in fairy tales, rom coms. You know, just everything is is telling us that story um, as a, as a love story, as a life plan, and the result of that is. When we do get a bit older, you know, we do appreciate that these things are ideals or fairy stories or not entirely realistic, right? That they lived happily ever after is not entirely realistic, but it doesn't dislodge the power of the story as an ideal for us. And that means as something that we can be measured against and found wanting, right? That, so um, knowing that the ideal is not realistic doesn't take its power away as a standard that we can judge ourselves by and judge others by. And that is absolutely what happens. Um, and that's why we get, um, you know, uh, those of us who have experienced uh, living in non-normative relationships, um, including those of us who've experienced living as uh, single people who want to you know, not enter into romantic relationships, um, have experienced the, the kind of stigma that goes along with that, right? Which um, which uh, it starts from the assumption that if you can't achieve that, uh, there must be something wrong with you, right? Everyone's everyone's trying to achieve the fairy tale, and those who can do, those who can't, oh dear, what's gone wrong? <laughs> um, and there's so there's there's absolutely no room. Um, in those baseline assumptions, you know, the ones that lead to comments like, when are you going to settle down? Or, oh, you're so attractive. I can't believe you haven't met someone yet. So those sound very, you know, they might sound very like, almost like nothing. But if you think about the, that second one, you're so attractive. I can't believe you haven't met someone yet. It makes it sound like people who aren't in a romantic relationships are, are, are by default not attractive people. Um, and that's what makes it surprising that an attractive person doesn't doesn't have a romantic relationship. So the kinds of those kinds of comments are actually having this really powerful um, motivating effect, whether we want them to or not, um, that uh, pushes us subtly or in some cases not so subtly towards that nuclear family model that find you find the one do the marriage, do the kids, do the laundry, the mortgage, da, 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 the rest of the story. Yeah. So that's, um, that's the power that those, that those stories have. And as I say, it doesn't come from us being naive and stupidly thinking that they're going to come true. I mean, some, some people probably do think that or hope that, but it's, it's not, it's not a, it's not a naivety. It's the fact that they are still, even in our awareness and with all our critical abilities on at full strength, they're still in there as yardsticks that we get measured. And what does all that have to do with capitalism, which you also mentioned earlier? With capitalism? Oh my goodness. Okay, so, well, uh, a lot. Um, <laughs> the, the, and is also the mentioned in this book, which is why so, I bring so it up. Yes, yes. This, so so I'll, 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 I'll tell you that how the connection gets from what I was just talking about before back to global capitalism. So, um, you know, the, the way that we've arranged our, our physical uh, living arrangements, right, to suit the nuclear family structure, um, that is just one manifestation of the fact that we have devalued other forms of connection 
um, that, that point us out beyond that small inward looking formation. So things like real community, like real deep ties with extended family, um, things that uh, things that are dangerous to uh, um, small and big C conservatism because they lead to things like collective action and unionization and you know just generally giving a about your neighbor um so those things um those things are um powerful motivations for social change um and so they are threats to the status quo and this is why uh you know i i talk about this too this is i think this is in sad love that i talk about this more so but the, the uh this is why i think someone like margaret thatcher in the 1980s was saying i don't believe in society there are individuals and there are families and she means nuclear families mm. and that's it right and the reason is because if you are if you are margaret thatcher that's the only, those are the only things you will countenance the individual is a consumer under capitalism the nuclear family is a slightly larger consuming unit under capitalism but still very manageable what you don't want is connections that um that really lead to to something that functions more like a real community that it involves real solidarity across divisions of class and other uh, dimensions of power and oppression, um, because those are the things that lead to to real change, to real challenge, to the status, to the conservative status quo. Um, and so, yes, that that is what it has to do with global capitalism. So when we go, you know, we might think, oh, my relationship. It's so private. It's such a personal matter. Um, and, you know, I go into my my home or I go into my bedroom and I close the door and all of that stuff stays in the public sphere. And that's absolutely not true. Right. <laughs> these these things are actually very intimately related. Um, and and none of us closes the door on our political uh, background, on our assumptions about what it is to live a good life. We, we bring those things right in with us. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, something like uh, polyamory or relationship anarchy, non-monogamy in general, anything that really encourages the formation of caring relationships um, that, that push beyond the nuclear family um, uh, represents that kind of that kind of threat or that kind of challenge to the um, to the the model of, of society is consisting just of individuals, just of, of consumers, just of manageable units that can be divided and, and ruled uh, as such. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, you know that's one of the main connections. And of course, what uh, what Tolbert is pointing out is that the imposition of of colonial attitudes to family and and love and relationships was accompanied by the imposition of European capitalistic economics and much more generally, you know, uh, political um, systems. Um, so these things are all, they're all connected to one another, which is, uh, yeah, one of the other things. Yeah, I'm reminded in the book. <laughs> yes, I'm reminded of um, something Mia Mingus said at a talk, I think about four or five years ago, um, that has really stuck with me. Um, and I'm paraphrasing, um, I probably live tweeted at it at the time and could go find it, but um, it's, that capitalism requires the breaking of relationships. And that's one of the, mm -hmm. those little, it's like just stuck with me for a really long time. And I've experienced that in so many ways at so many different levels uh, since then when I didn't ever have a name for it before. Um, but mm -hmm. th this insistence that we, not be interdependent um, with anyone except a, a spouse, essentially, um, yeah, yeah. or a child. Um, it yeah. keeps us so dependent on the uh, the whole system because you yeah. know who's how how will you what will you do if you become disabled or you know when you're elderly if you don't have money well you need money so you need you will have to an, pay an for RSP, you need yeah. to buy stocks you've got to you know you've got to win at the system in order to yeah. not suffer and die horribly um because Absolutely. we don't have communities yeah. that take care of each other yeah yeah because that interdependence has been broken and you know this is this is also why we have um 
such an epidemic of, of loneliness and isolation, um, you know, in, in all of the societies where this this idea of, of you know, um, what it is to live a good life has, has taken a hold. Um, it's also why, uh, you know, the, the idea of the, the pursuit of happiness ends up looking like the pursuit of money uh, because money under capitalism, you're supposed to be, your, your happiness is something you're going to be purchasing, right? You're going to be <laughs> getting on Amazon and, and getting whatever the latest do that is that you think is going to make you happy or the Rolex watch or the BMW. Um, and that is, um, that is uh, a way of, in, uh, of continually encouraging us to feel lacking and wanting in something that we need to, purchase so that we will then no longer be lacking but of course what the, yeah, then we just have to buy the the next biggest one or whatever the, the 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 actual duration of the serotonin hit from buying something lasts you know a couple of days two three days at most and then you have to go back on amazon right so it's uh, it's a it's a um a cyclical thing that ultimately uh is futile and you know the the psychological and philosophical research on on the so-called pursuit of happiness, all points in the same direction, telling us it's it is counterproductive. Like, ch chasing your own happiness is not a way to to become happy. There there might be ways to become happy, but but pursuing happiness isn't one of them. <laughs> um, but it is it's very it's very centrally baked into especially into um, to U.S. culture, right? The idea that you should that the pursuit of happiness is this most natural thing in the world and such an obvious thing that everybody wants to do. Um, what it actually does, that that, I, that ideology is, uh, it, it, it leads people to feel that they're perpetually failing because they are not, in fact, becoming happy. Um, and that, that sense of failure then, again, sends them back into the, into the capitalist um, economy looking for quick fixes. Um, what I've I've tried to do in in um, these these two books especially is uh, foreground other ways of thinking about what a good life looks like and relatedly what a good love looks like um, that center notions like meaningfulness and collaboration and connection and creativity um, and all of these things um, have absolutely nothing to do with with buying anything which is you know <laughs> why you don't you don't uh, um, you don't see them baked into the uh, U.S. Declaration of Independence or its self conception, um, but uh, what they what they do do is uh, enable us to get away from. I mean, even the very idea of ro lo romantic love as as the most important kind of love, right? The kind that everybody should be aiming after because it's the ultimate happy ever after. Um, once you once you step away from the, the pursuit of happiness um, and start to center, you know what actually makes life meaningful for you. There are so so many other ways of relating to one another than the romantic, mm -hmm. dyadic, monogamous, marriage-like relationship, um, and all of them can be collaborative, creative, meaningful. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so yeah, that's that's a big part of the work um, in both of these books um, and understanding, you know, non-monogamy as as one of the ways that um that we uh can challenge the the dominant narrative because it's so it's a very obvious one right it's such it's such an obvious one which mm -hmm. i think is why it gets so kind of uh potently and sometimes uh, violently policed it's such an obvious challenge to the mono normative um fairy tale mm -hmm. yeah when but you like talked I've, about uh, okay. Sorry, I was going to say, I, I feel like I've talked about this a lot, but I, I also want to make sure to leave plenty of time to talk about the other books in the series and, and yours included. Yeah. Um, I don't mean to cut um, off any questions about that, but I want to make sure we get to that as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of, of that. Um, there is a part of me that wants to talk less and is happy to give you the mic for as long <laughs> as you want it, and I'll take was left at the end. Um, and also, I just enjoy hearing you talk about these things. So, um, um, but I do have, uh, we will get to it, we will get to it soon, I promise. But um, I, this is, I'm not sure if this is a, this might be a question or maybe an invitation. Um, it's a thought that I was having as you were talking, but um, you you mentioned the privatization of, the, of relationships, um, which is something that has been on my mind um, a lot lately. Um, because 
there's a, a an essay that was written six or seven years ago uh, by another Canadian writer. Um, I think his name is Tad Har Hargreave. Um, called After the Hurt, Who Will Restore the Wholeness on the Privatization of Relationships. And he talks about how, about sort of the role of the community in conflict resolution and the fact that two people who are in conflict with, with one another generally are not the best positioned to resolve that conflict. Uh, and that we really need these other close bonds to come in and, say, and kind of work with us and say, hey, like, let's work this out. And of course, to have that, you need um, enough people who are invested in both of you, who know both of you, um, and, um, <clears throat> and and who are invested in the relationship working because that really, whether it's a romantic relationship or a friendship or, you know, parent-child, whatever, because that is part of the, the community. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is something too that uh, Nora Samarin writes about um, on her Nurturance Culture blog and possibly in, in her book is sort of the importance of the whole community in creating um, space to hold people who are in conflict and help them move through it. And it's just interesting. Um, I have been, I each time I go through a, a breakup, of course, this is primarily, well, yeah. Um, uh, I've noticed this more uh, with white men and particularly WASP men. <laughs> um, so white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, which is really the culture that we're talking about, right? This individualized privatized culture yeah, yeah. that there is very much this view of like, there's your circle and there's my circle. There's your friends and there's my friends. We are taking the mm -hmm. whole thing and we're, mm -hmm. and, and, and everybody gets aside and, yeah. you know, and, and then there's this like this raw, conflict and pain that's kind of left there unresolved and of course the way that that you know white capitalist culture deals with that is just be, by saying well you that relationship relationship all forms of it is over now um because people are disposable because capitalism requires the severing of relationships because 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 yeah. um <laughs> whereas there's no buy like, since, and feel right <laughs> right it's like if this was if we had and i i i feel like every time this i i experience this or watch a friend going through it i also feel this like profound sense of like grief about society <laughs> like i want mm -hmm, to live mm -hmm. in a different world i want to live in a different society where this is just not allowed to happen where everybody yeah. knows that they're held and that there yeah. are that, that there are people who will who want this to the conflict to be resolved who will help with that where you know we trust people to do that and yeah. instead you know everybody is just taught to like increase the fragmentation in so many ways. Yeah, and it so, might become part of the conflict, right? So you are either joining, you know, team A or team B, and you just become part of the, the conflicting, the warring mm -hmm. factions. And there's no, um, there's no um, understanding or accountability in that. There's no role for uh, community healing. There's no, there's no way, uh, I like this, this way you put it, there's no way that pe the, the, the people in that conflict are, are held, right? They're not held up. They're not held accountable. There's, there's nothing. It's like, you're just falling. And that's, um, but this is, I think entirely, uh, this is a really kind of crucial moving part of, um, of the, the entire dynamic. So both in that it, it's very much about that sort of privatization. So the, the breakup is an individual problem. It's private. It's between you two over there. And, you know, it's not, it's not the community's business to be paying attention. This is all part of the narrative. Um, this is also that this, this idea that relationships are extremely private things is also how it's so easy to isolate someone, right? So it's abusive relationships, very easy to, to um, say, oh, just, just focus on me, the relationship. You don't need your friends. You don't need your family, right? Isolate, isolate. And it all feeds into that same romantic narrative that this one person is my everything. Very, very vulnerable position for someone to get into, but also very much in, in accordance with that lack of community oversight of what's going on inside that so-called private space um lack of accountability lack of holding holding up holding accountable um and yeah the um the the ways in which when it falls apart you know 
everything all is lost is also mm. very much part and parcel of the same um uh, the same dynamic, which tells us, you know, basically there, there are two possibilities for romantic love, absolute bliss, the fairy tale, happy ever after, or absolute disaster, tragedy, everything is, you know, goes to, and you're, you're devastated and wrecked. And, you know, there's absolutely no, uh, we, we just don't tell all of the actual stories, which are somewhere in between those two, right? Very wide range in between those two, but somewhere in between those two. Um, and, you know, it, it, it lends itself, that dynamic lends itself to this idea that, well, if you're not on the, if you're not waking up every morning singing that hills are alive with, with the sound of music, um, then it's time to break up. And moreover, that will be, you know, a devastating uh, loss. And um, mm -hmm. there's, you know, um, there's our, our models both in, in, you know, listen to, you know, popular music about breakups, um, read classic works of great literature. It's like everyone instantly becomes, um, you know, suicidally depressed and like instantly becomes devastated. And there's nothing anyone can do about that. Right? There's no, okay, now it's time for the, for the community to, to close up around and help to heal. None of that, right? It's just mm -hmm. I'm on my own because this person has left me and I have now I have nothing. I have no one. And again, that, that same kind of thing where it's about the isolation of the of the couple, the monogamous couple or the nuclear family unit, the isolation, the the severing of all of those other connections that could have formed that support system. Um, that's yeah, it's all it's all connected. This this is our, um, you know, I think it's one of the our our great, um, one of our many great great failures as a as a society. Mm -hmm. We have left people yeah. in, in those um, in those kind of situations. I also want to mention too that this is from a very heteronormative perspective as well, which of course is part of all of this. But that uh, mm -hmm. I think that in queer communities. Uh, you don't see quite as much of that isolation and fragmentation and, and people, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more, um, it, it just, it doesn't work quite the same way. It, it doesn't. I mean, really, honestly, any kind of community is, is mm -hmm. able to counteract this and, you know, queer communities, yeah. they tend to be unusual in being communities. <laughs> and, right. And that Real communities, amazing. not just the things, yes, the scenes absolutely. that we call community. <laughs> Yeah, not just, yeah. you know, a few people that you go to art class with or something like that, you mm -hmm. know, the friends that you, as soon as they leave the room, you say, oh, God, I can't stand that person. No, mm -hmm. an actual, like an actual community. And and that, yes, it's, it's unusual and it only tends to happen in these kind of subcultural spaces. Um, mm -hmm. But but that is that is exactly what what we need in, in, you know, in order to have any hope, I think, of ultimately su surviving as a species, but that's a separate question, but especially mm -hmm. to, to survive these moments as, as healthy humans and intact. And yeah, I think, yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've seen it happen in, in queer communities, um, strong extended family bonds um, and, you know, other, other spaces like that where there's some other model for relating to human beings than just the, the waspy, heteronormative dominant model yeah 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 um i a friend of mine said to me years ago um <clears throat> and i can't remember if she made this up or if she heard it from somewhere else but that if your if your community doesn't include children and elders you don't have a community you have a scene <laughs> Yeah, and that's really that's stuck fair. with me. <laughs> yeah, and 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 I also was talking to a friend recently about um, you know scenes that we call communities, but where there aren't a lot of like deep one-on-one -on -one relationships, and you really kind of need those one-on-one -on -one relationships, kind of you know cross networked yeah. throughout the community for it to be a community, one that is resilient yeah. and can take care of each other and solve conflicts. Exactly, exactly that. Um, and too too much of what we what we think of as or what we apply the label community to is is a scene in that sense. And you know, it could be it could be an art class. It could be you know, a kink. It could be anything. But it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't serve the role of of a community unless, as you say, there is actual like genuine human connection happening within it. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, a, a lot of folks coming from um, 
you know, Euro Eurocentric uh, cultures, um, certain strata of that society would have once had their their religious communities playing that role. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that's, you know, that, that's got its own issues, um, multiple mm -hmm. issues in the Wikipedia sense. Um, Including playing the role of supporting the monogamous marriage, marriage that, unit. Exactly, that's, <laughs> and that's with them with their conflicts. And, yeah. um, but yes, it was it was there for, for situations like that. And a, a lot of the reason why a, a marriage would have looked the way it did with lots of witnesses and everybody coming to say we support this is when things start to go wrong, they were supposed to be the ones to show up and try to help put it right you know um yeah. and that that doesn't happen anymore right if we have a, a big marriage now it's a it's a party and you know mm -hmm. everyone's just having a very good time and then they'll all go back to you know that that sense of it being a, a community for the relationship is very very mm -hmm. much been lost and yeah if it hasn't been for folks who are, are lucky enough and able to to um to get a hold of something like a, a genuine queer community in the, the real sense, um, where it's not just a scene, it's actual, mm -hmm. it actually has those real bonds in it. Um, or for people who are very, very lucky to have uh, families of origin that that um, that resemble a community, um, you know, which I am, you know, always always in awe and, and extremely jealous of when I see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those those are those are um, yeah, those are amazing things. But but really so much of the dominant narrative works against it and, and even actively denigrates it um, that mm -hmm. it's it's hard it's hard to find yeah but to, speaking of being jealous uh -huh. <laughs> yeah both of these amazing connections um, the, right the right that's the segue <laughs> to talk about um the other books in the series including mine um so uh, those of you who are familiar with my uh, original, my first book, More Than Two, might recognize the shape on uh, Carrie's cover. Uh, we've taken this motif and reflected it throughout the book series. So um, after More Than Two was published, um, uh, I published a small book called Polyamory and Jealousy that was actually the jealousy chapter for More Than Two, taken out, revised, expanded. Um, and reissued originally as an ebook, and then it was vid and the next done as a, a print book. And we called it, um, I, I called it the, the More Than Two Essentials series. Um, and the idea was to kind of originally to kind of revise and repackage the More Than Two content and improve it with time. Uh, but I, I never did any more chapters. And so um, as starting at the beginning of this year, uh, because I really wanted to start one focusing on Canadian authors because the you know the vast majority of the books out there are, are written by Americans, and two, uh, allowing space for really uh, you know specific focus topics that weren't just how to guides, uh, how to guides or memoir memoirs, which is largely what we had. So um, the first book in this series uh, is non monogamy non monogamy and neurodiversity uh, by Alyssa Gonzalez, um, who uh, lives in uh, Ottawa, and then we had in the summer we had non monogamy and teaching, um, which this is uh, primarily um, for teachers, but it also turns out to be uh, to have some really useful information on how to talk to about kid talk to kids about non monogamy. So if you have kids in your life who you need to talk to about non monogamy, get this book. Um, and then of course there's Carrie's book. Um, and uh, there will be a website. Uh, it's in preparation right now. It's at more than two dot ca, um, not the American website. So just remember this dot ca uh, at the end. And um, right now, it just lists all the forthcoming books in the series. But it will. Uh, we are developing content for it. Um, so I am reworking the polyamory and jealousy book. It's going to be republished uh, as non monogamy and jealousy. And that has turned out, I thought, oh, it's only 10,000 words. I can, you know, I, you know, I can revise that in a day. No How big hard deal. can it be, 10,000 words? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, uh, and yeah, I think my original due date for the manuscript was in January, and I still haven't turned it in. So, um, and it's just, it's proven to be um, very, well, I mean, there were bits of it that were triggering. There were bits of it where I was suffering from a lot of imposter syndrome. Um, you know, the way I think 
now is very different from when I thought thought about it at the, the way I think thought at the time that I wrote it. Um, I considered just scrapping the whole thing and starting over from scratch. I still might do that because honestly, writing another ten thousand words is probably m might be easier than revising the ones that I have. Um, so uh, that's uh, underway, um, and we'll get done. Um, <laughs> It's so it's fascinating to hear. <laughs> I, because I, you know, I, no, I went through this. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I went through something a little similar with this one, where mm -hmm. I, I, I ended up scrapping like huge chunks, and and because it's, I started it pre-pandemic, and then went into the mm -hmm. pandemic, and, uh, you know, I was like, what am I, what world am I even writing towards? And I, I had massive writer's block for a couple of years, so it's kind of, um, it's good to hear, you know. More, it's good to hear more stories about you know <laughs> the what it takes to write content like this. To be honest, because mm -hmm. when we do this, we're very we're vulnerable. We're we put ourselves on the line to talk about these things. And like you mm -hmm. say, a lot of the content can be triggering, and it can mm -hmm. be it's it's personal, whether or not we're actually talking about our own personal situations, which mm -hmm. sometimes we are. Like I'm, I I do it in my in my work because I don't feel like I, there's any way to set it aside it's gonna be the elephant in the room if I don't talk about it so um but even if we're not it's still personal because this is this is personal subject matter so yeah it's good yeah. to yeah yeah it, uh, it's good uh, to, to I, acknowledge that. yeah I had a conversation um a few months ago when I was working on the manuscript with Jessica Fern, the author of Polysecure and Polywise. Oh, yay. Um, <laughs> yeah, and um, she talked about, and I maybe she, I think she does cover this in Polysecure, although I, I didn't clearly, clearly remember it, but the difference between jealousy and primal panic and what a lot of people, you know, she, she refers to, she says, is it, is it me, we, or society? Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, you can, the, the, like, we call a lot of things jealousy and uh yeah. but one of them is is actually primal attachment panic so yeah. we and yeah. that's when that it's just like that horrible overwhelming i feel like i'm dying kind of yeah. experience because the attachment has been threatened yeah. um and then but there could could also be um real problems in the relationship and relationship neglect um Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, as they wrote about in Polywise, just the, what they call justice jealousy. So uh, they're getting mm -hmm. some, the other other person is getting something I've always wanted and thought wasn't available. And now I know it is, just mm -hmm. not to me. Uh, not and that's fair. very difficult. Yeah. And yeah. Um, or society, which is what are the stories that I'm telling about? And I think that's, you know, what touches on your book is like books. Yeah. That, what are the stories that I have about relationships that are being contradicted by what's happening in my relationship now. So, you know, maybe mm -hmm. I don't feel that primal panic, maybe our relationship is fine, but I still have this deeply ingrained story that, um, that I'm not really loved or I'm not really val valuable if my partner also loves somebody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they can be interconnecting too, right? So you get the mm -hmm. you get the narrative in your head. It, it starts off as mm -hmm. a society problem, and you, you think about that for a few nights. You stay up worrying about it, and then you have the primal panic at the end of that process. Right. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's not. It's not a, you don't have to pick just one one of these. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they feed onto each other and then spiral. And yeah, it's lovely. lovely. And then so, these. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's such a it's such a messy topic, and so. Conceptually, it's fascinating to me. I mean, the you know, mm -hmm. as you said, we, we use this word jealousy for so many things that are really so very different from one another. Um, mm -hmm. And it's yeah, I whenever I would so when I when I wrote this this one first one, whenever I would go talk about it, it doesn't really talk about jealousy very much. It's just not about that really. Um, but whenever I would go talk about it, and I would say that I was in non-monogamous relationships like everyone wanted me to talk about jealousy and like mm -hmm. how how horrible is it and how do you deal with it and I was like my, my book's not about that I I don't really yeah <laughs> that's not something that I'm well you can soon you can about. refer them to, <laughs> to yeah. this one but little book I, I, need the, <laughs> I need the citation to just uh, mm -hmm. tell people to go read this other thing but what was interesting to me about it was that people just assumed that that would be you know the main thing about being non-monogamous mm -hmm. would be the jealousy I was like, oh 
no, I, I, for me, like one of the main things about trying to be monogamous was the jealousy. Uh, and mm. uh, take, <laughs> take take the yeah. idea that you that, that that someone being with someone else is is a threat out of the picture, and you lose a lot of those reasons to to be jealous. So, um, mm. but it, it was always such a touchstone of an issue that I think it's. Um, yeah, I, I both really value the work you're doing on it, and also see why it must be so difficult um, and you know mm -hmm. my thinking on this has evolved massively too over the last mm -hmm. many years so I can only imagine like having to the, the idea of trying to revise anything I wrote uh, even five years ago I'd be <laughs> but yeah. you see this is where one well, of my favorite phrases comes in which is that changing your mind is the best proof that you have one <laughs> that's yeah it's true it's true <laughs> Um, yeah, and I mean, it's it might not be it might be easier for me to rewrite ten thousand words and to revise it, but um, that's a good segue into my other announcement, which is um, that I am working on. Uh, I did acquire full rights to uh, my first book, More Than Two, uh, at the beginning of this year, and am working on a huge revised edition of that. Um, so <laughs> and uh, not going to be rewriting that book, but. Um, it was uh, it was going to be an, an impossible job by myself. It was it was just not something I was going to be able to do. So, um, uh, Andrea Zanin, who um, is the substantive editor, of, I, sh I know she was the, the editor for your book. She's the substantive editor for most of Thorn Apple's books, um, and is in her own right a um, you know a, a writer and teacher, and it has is in the process of revising that book and uh she her contributions have uh been uh have reached the point where uh we're now she's going to be a co-author of the book Amazing. so um so more than two second edition uh eve rickert with andrea zanin is coming out in september 2024 um i have I heard it a, here first folks that's right. Um, I have an absolutely gorgeous new cover that I'm really excited to reveal, but it is not quite ready yet. Um, but uh, she's been working with the manuscript uh, for a mm, couple months now, and uh, we have to have it ready for copy editing by the end of the year, and it's going to be landing in my lap very soon. And I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> of what I'm going to have to do. Um, but I'm so, so, so grateful that she's doing the first cut and just like, like there's, there's so much. And, you know, going into it, I knew, um, I, you know, I had a list. I did like a two page memo. Of, this is what we need to fix in this book. And uh, getting into it, it's so much more than that. Um, you know, it's, it's very, like I knew it was, very heteronormative, but I wasn't aware of how much. And it was very cisnormative. I was not aware of how much. I knew, mm -hmm. um, you know, something that um, Andrea pointed out to me on our last call is just sort of this pervasive sexism in the book that the women are just in the examples are all just very badly behaved. <laughs> and <laughs> in a way that, and, you know, just one of those subtle things where it's like, yeah. if you till aren't. Until you, you see it, you don't see it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so um, so lots of things that mm -hmm. need to be fixed, um, and thank thank goodness I have someone to work with me on that, and um, I, I'm just tremendously well. Right now, I'm not excited about it because I I still have the <laughs> my part of the revision task up ahead of me, <laughs> um, and. Hmm. Um, we're not sure also what's going to happen with all the personal stories that were in it because I was very self-disclosing in the first edition and, mm -hmm. um, you know, ended up not being as comfortable with that as I thought I would, would be. And, um, well, and none of those relationships exist anymore. So, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. it's, and I don't want to write new stories. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a t it's such a, yeah, these things are such a tough call. I, I have, you know, I, I like I said, I, t I have some personal stuff in in my books too. And it, it, you're mm -hmm. always, you know, I think any any author who's writing in in this in this ballpark always walking this very fine line, right, between disclosure, vulnerability, revealing stuff that they then wish they sort of hadn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about stuff that then you know turns out to be a very different picture five years later and mm -hmm. you know that's true for like I 
one in this in this book i i had to you know it's called non-monogamy and happiness i have to talk about the fact i'm i'm actually not in non-monogamous relationships anymore yeah. myself yeah. um and I, yeah. I was like well am i going to just not mention it like no i can't mm -hmm. i can't not mention it that's like that's part of the story now so i, mm -hmm. I end up talking about about that and about about that transition from um, mm -hmm. non-monogamy to, to monogamy and uh it, it became part of but you know these the, the, you're mm -hmm. always kind of walking this line and and um you know uh i i especially um uh you know i i just want to sort of thank you for doing the work on this right uh, the, these choices that we're making all the time this the editing work the trying to find what what is when is it self-editing when is it self-censoring when is it oversharing mm -hmm. when is it and, and for me as well i often think when is it other sharing about other people's stuff that they might mm -hmm. not want me to share about them yeah. so all of these different considerations and it's it's yeah it's 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 worth think, being a writer you know yeah really work. well and i think at the time that the first more than two was written um I mean, it's interesting how I just use the passive voice. I don't even really feel like it was me writing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, at the time that I wrote the first more than two, um, I think there was, you know, even uh, there was so much. I'm, I'm working on talking about this in, in my preface for the new edition, <laughs> but things were really so different even mm -hmm. 10 years ago. So different. And yeah. just thinking about everything that has happened since, I mean, really it was, you know, early 2014 that the the first edition was going off to copy editing uh, mm -hmm. so much has happened um right. and in, since then um but one of those things is like i think there have been multiple shifts in how people treat self-disclosure mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and i think at that time that we were at kind of a height of the mm -hmm. self that self-disclosure um mm -hmm. and i know i at least in um you know, the the circles that I run in, run in, I think there's been a lot of pulling back from that and yeah. almost backlash yeah. to that because it's like, oh, yeah. that doesn't yeah. feel yeah. good to be. No, I know. Yeah. You know, I was, people realizing I was, that yeah. the cost of it. Yeah. 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 Well, and 10 years later, so, it, you know, that's still out there. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and uh, you're absolutely right. The, the, um, the, the backlash, the cost, the, you know, it, it's, um, you know, for, for me, it's something I've tracked. Like this, the cost of this book shows up in this book. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. the, the, the reason I'm writing about sad love is I'm trying to talk about like what what if you are you know depressed? How are you supposed to be happy mm -hmm. ever after? A lot of the mm -hmm. reason I'm depressed is because what happened because it's talking about mm -hmm. my life in yeah. this one. You know, and it yeah. it it, um, it all just kind of um, it it takes a massive toll. And 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 your um, you know your situation is obviously different everyone's situation is different by by the nature mm -hmm. of it but i think you're right that these things um we're we're learning more over time how to do these things safely mm -hmm. and um you know it, some of us are, are lucky enough to to <laughs> learn more about how to cut be how to be communities for each other and mm -hmm. and offer that kind of support to to each other as as writers or people working in in these um in these areas of i don't know research inquiry investigation mm -hmm. human thought human life um and you know it's it, and the world has changed so much in those mm -hmm. 10 odd years yeah. too i was talking about i had a, an interview earlier today and i was just talking about you know what what kind of um what kind of uh, experiences i had talking about being non-monogamous um 10, 12 years ago versus now, and mm -hmm. they were really different. I mean, not that the same changes have happened everywhere, like parts of the world have very much not kept pace, but um, I, the the baseline, like I, I, I teach at a university and the baseline awareness now of undergraduate students, let's say, like most of them are 18, 20 years old, they know so much that, Mm -hmm. this vocabulary yeah. and so much conceptual awareness and sophistication around gender sex relationships boundaries consents you know all of this kind of mm -hmm. stuff that they just know as an absolute starting point and it's kind of mm -hmm. you know it's it's so it's it's now very different to be writing mm -hmm. knowing that your audience is going to be 
you know, folks like that and folks who are mm -hmm. who are able to to access that kind of th those kind of levels of sophistication. That at the time, you know, I, I think the time when we met, we were both kind of trying <laughs> to get mm -hmm. more of that on on the oh hello kitty <laughs> 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 whose tail is this <laughs> that that would be Gigi she's uh, hey Gigi hello yeah. oh. if she comes back I'll see if I can <laughs> get her to show her face on camera <laughs> her maybe, maybe she needs to let us know it's uh, it's dinner time <laughs> yeah well it's two hours from dinner time but she also hasn't quite figured out the t the time change yet I was but, gonna um, say my, my cat is also on mm. on the wrong time zone. She thinks dinner is an hour earlier, but then I mean she yeah. always thought that. So. 